Good evening. I am Paula Fontana, Vice President of Strategic Programming Initiatives with the National Black MBA Association. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program, Rewriting Your Future Through Financial Planning. So tonight's program is a perfect example of the benefits of membership in that we provide programming such as this year round. However, in addition to our year round programming, we have our conference and career fair. This year, it will be a virtual experience, so you definitely do not want to miss it. Ways to engage and sign up for the registration link will be in the chat box for you. So as many of you hopefully know, our association is comprised of 39 chapters and tonight I have the absolute pleasure of partnering with one of my favorite chapters and that is the New York chapter under the leadership of the chapter president Andrew Hamilton. So Andrew has served this chapter for more than a decade. He has experience in board development and organizational leadership. His strength is his ability to inspire and drive change, negotiate new partnerships, and create positive cultures and outcomes. And Andrew, I want you to know that you inspire me daily, and we understand the sacrifice that is for you to join us this evening, and we thank you so very much. You have the floor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to another series about financial literacy presented by the Metro New York chapter of the Black MBAs. Uh, I cannot uh, say thank you enough to our members, our partners, uh, especially our partners, uh, NASDAQ, that inspired us to do this event initially last year on November 6th and has been rolling ever since. I, in my opinion, uh, uh, come across many people, many financial professionals, but I never come across these two, and they're, these two really inspire me to do better in um, handling finances, but more importantly, just handling your business as, as well. So we have Anthony from Merrill Lynch, we have Christina from Credit Suisse, and more importantly, uh, our moderator is Ms. Julie Walker from Associated Press, which I'm more, more, more happy that she's able to join us. Thanks again to Bruce, thanks again to Paula, thanks again to Dee, thanks again to my fellow chapter presidents and in, in inspiring and leading us in presenting these knowledges and these information to our community, because financial literacy is important to you, it's important to all of us, because a strong economy makes a strong society. A strong society can do um, wonderful and great things. Without further ado, we'll begin our session now. Uh, Julie, are you ready? I'm absolutely ready. And I wanna say thank you for having me and thank you to everyone for tuning in. Um, I wanna get going because we have an hour, which sounds like a lot of time, but it's really not. We wanna tackle a lot of subjects. So just quickly, let's dive right in with Christina and Anthony and let's get this out of the way. What is financial planning and what are the benefits of a financial planner? And can you both address this just quickly, please? Yeah, yeah sure, um, I, I'll start. And Julie, thank you, uh, Chuck and Andrew and Paula and Dee, thank you all so much and everybody from the National Black MBA Association for having us today. We're honored to be able to uh, speak to you all today. So when I think about what financial planning and is I think it's about the coordination of all the different moving pieces of the puzzle of your financial life working in tandem to make sure that your finances and your balance sheet are optimized in a way whereby you're, you're planning for yourself and for your goals, both for yourself and your family and your community. And so the planning aspect is really an exercise whereby we're making sure that your personal finances aren't decaying over time and it's staying intact with what you, what's most important to you, which is your goals, your aspirations, and um, you know other things that you want to support by being organized. <clears throat> exactly. I would just add, we literally do a front to back look, and we're reviewing the client's entire financial health. So literally from the basement to the attic, we even get the cobwebs out as well, and make sure that we address even the smaller details also. So whether you're saving for a wedding, whether you're saving for retirement, your child's education, or looking to get a better investment strategy, this is when you will come to a financial planner. Okay, so let's talk about your money, my money, your money, whether you have $1,000 or $100,000, what should you do with it? 
low interest rates. Do I buy property? Do I invest in the stock market? Warren Buffett says yes. Do I pay off my debt, whether that's student loan or whether that's some other big debt like a balloon mortgage, or should I just leave it in the bank for a rainy day? One thing I know you don't want to do is put it in your freezer, right? <laughs> Sure. So what should I do with my money? Um, let me have both of you answer that. Who wants to go first? Uh, I'll start. So, you know, I, I think that that question is something, you know, something that we hear on a daily basis. Hey, I have this, you know, this nest egg or I have these assets that I've saved over time. You know, what should I be, you know, what should I be doing? And, you know, I, I think it's about the, the exercise of, taking a look at your total picture and making sure that you're pairing out with respective goals. Um, so it, it, it's definitely not the sexy answer, but it helps to find the way by which you're able to find the right answer by going through this process. And so the first thing that you should do at all times, regardless of if you have a nest egg or not, is take an accounting of your total balance sheet and your net worth. And so the first thing that we do is we take a look at all assets that you may have. Do I have a 401k or a retirement plan? Do I have any extra cash saved in the bank? Do I own any real estate? Is it in my name? Is it joint tenants with rights of survivorship? Is it tenants in common? How is it all titled? And then also, you have to also look at the liability side of the balance sheet as well. Do I have any student loans? Do I have any credit cards? Do I have a high interest rate mortgage? Do I have any fixed or floating rate debt out there? And so when you're able to look at your total balance sheet in a way whereby you're looking at your assets and liabilities at the same time, First and foremost, we should be able to take a look at it and spot check for any inefficiencies right off the balance sheet to, for starters. So, for example, if you have a lot of debt and it's you know high interest rates uh, or a lot of credit card debt, and you know maybe if your credit card debt's at twenty percent, for example, in, in this scenario, maybe it makes more sense to pay down debt versus saving in the markets, whereby you know you don't necessarily you can't guarantee that you're going to get a twenty percent return, and so. I think that that exercise of going about it helps to inform you, number one. So taking an accounting of your balance sheet. Number two, taking an accounting of your goals, right? Um, am I looking to retire with these assets? Is this long-term capital? Is this short-term capital? Am I looking to save for a liquidity need in the next 18 to 24 months? Am I saving for a down payment on a home? Am I saving for a wedding? You know, what are these dollars for? And so you can take a lot of the guesswork out of the equation, which is one of the reasons why people end up holding on to a lot of cash because they don't necessarily know what they want to do. And so if you can take an accounting of all the different priorities that you have and then prioritize the priorities, you know, what's most important to me, saving for education for my kids or my grandkids or retirement for myself or getting in that new home, that will allow you to start to think more prudently and easily about what you should do um, with any nest egg or any uh, excess cash you may have. I, I would definitely add to that. You definitely want to make sure you have a rainy day fund as well. And I know Anthony you focused on the, the balance sheet and you mentioned you, you do have to have savings, but especially generally you want to have three to six months of your rainy day fund or emergency fund. But when you're in times uncertain as we are now, you want to draw that out a bit. And so I would recommend pretty much eight to 12 months, if not even longer, just to build up that your savings, your emergency fund on, on your balance sheet. And then you mentioned something about Warren Buffett, Julie. So you said Warren Buffett says yes in terms of investing. And you mentioned, hey, what if I have $1,000 or I have $100,000? I just want to let people know it doesn't matter how little you may have or if you have an excess of money, you can always start. You can always start now in terms of investing. And we'll get into some of that a little bit later, but there's fractional shares if you can't afford to, to buy entire stock because of the value in terms of the capital is too high. The cost is a cost barrier. For instance, Tesla stock is over 1500 right now. So many people are talking about that and they want to get in, but it, it may be too cost prohibitive. But what you can do is you can go in fractional, get fractional shares and, and that's in the set. So, and one of the other things you want to look at too, in terms of, of investing, you want to look at your risk appetite as well and how much you actually can stomach because some people can't, you can look at your friends and say, oh, well, my friends are getting into this strategy or they're doing this, but what can you actually tolerate in terms of day-to-day -day volatility and, and movement? And so I would just add that 
in turn, you don't have to have a lot, guys. We can all get started. Okay, well, that's that's a great setup for our next question. Um, and from now on, we're going to alternate between each one of you taking the next, taking one question, and that way we'll get through more of them, and we'll have more of a chance for our listeners to chime in. And you know, anybody with questions, please. There's a Q and A section in our webinar, so at the bottom of your screen, you can just click on Q and A and type away, and we'll get to those. Um, at the back end of this. So please type those questions in so that we can read them out later on and answer them. But weekly paycheck, okay? Again, whether you're making $100 a day, $1,000 a day, or $0 a day because you're either in a gig economy job or you're unemployed, how do you prioritize? How do you allocate? Where does it go in terms of X percent is saved, X percent goes to daily expenses that you have to live off of? And, you know, we're in a an uncertain job market, right? The unemployment numbers sure. now today, we've got COVID. So tell me, weekly paycheck, where does it go? Yeah, and, and I, I think that if you know where the check is gonna go before it hits, it's a lot easier to control the behavior and make sure it goes to the right spot, right? And so, uh, you know, it, assuming you've gone through the process of doing a financial plan, going through a budget, understanding what your, um, your, your assets and liabilities are and your income versus your expenses are, it should be a relatively easy exercise, right? So I'm gonna be a little bit blanket here because I don't know everybody's situation, uh, but you know, it, it's, it's all about making sure that home base is, is taken care of first, right? So I don't know if there are many parents on, 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 this, uh, on this meeting today, uh, but you know, certain things like making sure that today and home is protected is really important. So I'm assuming that we've taken a look at life insurance. I'm assuming that we have a budget whereby we know what's coming in. And if there's a surplus to be able to save, we should be thinking about saving every single dollar in excess of the amount that you can, you can, you can, um, you, you generate. And so um, if we do a budget and you know that you spend, you know, $150 a month or a week on groceries because you know, you have kids in the house and we're not leaving and, and so on and so forth. Bake that into the cake, have a budget, have an understanding of where everything is going. And if you know what your paycheck is going to be on a post-tax basis and you know where all your spend is going, you shouldn't understand and know how much of a surplus you're going to have, if any. Um, and if you have a surplus, you should be thinking about saving that dollar amount either every other week or every month or so. And so you can challenge yourself to just try to hit that number, right? And so if I can just hit that number, I know I'm in a good spot and it's a small win every two weeks or every month, whereby I know every month for me, if I wanna save $250 a week, some people's numbers are $30,000 a week or $50,000 a week and some people's numbers might be $25 a week. It doesn't really make a difference, but you can feel good about yourself going about your daily life whereby you know what's coming in, you know what's going out, and you know that you know on the 15th of the month or the first of the month, your account balance should be in excess of the amount that you're supposed to save every single month. So I think it's just, it just kind of comes back to the, to the budget and the balance sheet. Um, and if you have like credit card debt or if you have expensive loans on the balance sheet, maybe it's just taking body blows to that stuff and paying that down in a more aggressive way. So um, there's no one size fits all answer towards where dollars need to go. But I think that the approach, again, is one size fits all, whereby if you know what's coming in, you know what's going out, you have everything prioritized based on what's most important to you and your goals, you should be able to save towards that goal on a monthly uh, or bi-weekly basis. Okay, next up, money and couples. It's a tough subject, but you can't and shouldn't ignore it, right? Joint account or separate finances. What are the pros and cons? Christina? Definitely. So when you have joint accounts, there's a lot of pros, right? You have consolidated view, you have full transparency, both part, part people in the relationship have access to all funds, should something happen to one of the partners. But on the downside, you may have one spouse that could potentially be overbearing and watch the account like a whole question, every single thing. There's the, the surprise element factor goes away. Let's say you want to buy your partner a really special present or something 
<laughs> to someone else. All of that is out of the window in, uh, in that case. So true. And, <laughs> and then God forbid, if the relationship ends, we've all seen this in movies. We've heard real life stories. One person liquidates the account prior to the other one even being aware. Then you see the Facebook status with the broken heart, relationship is over. And they're like, what, what happened? I'm being extreme, but those are the things that really do happen. So these are some pros and cons of, of joint accounts. And when you come to financial planners, advisors, essentially if you come in as a couple and you guys agree that you're gonna be seen together as a couple, you're gonna be seen as one unit together. And so all decisions will be made for the consolidated couple. In terms of separate bank accounts, there are pros in terms of that you have independence it may work for some people where you know you have your accounts on, on the side you control your own destiny you control your own money but then again there are cons which are opposite of the pros with the joint accounts because there's a lack of transparency there's a fragmented view and you don't have access to to everything now which one works best we don't get involved in domestic disputes, but um, it's going to be up to the couple and to, to decide exactly which 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 uh, work, which strategy is best for them to employ. Okay, so let's move on to. I see the questions rolling in, and we're going to try to get to as many as possible. But let's roll into debt for a moment. And Anthony, <coughs> one are what are some of the ways the wealthy use debt to increase their own wealth? Because we um, as African Americans, we lag behind uh, in terms of every aspect of finances. And I'll read off some numbers in a bit, but um, we have to start thinking about using a lot of the tools that the wealthier use. Um, so what are some of the ways that you can yeah. get here for you? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, we're at historic lows in terms of interest rates um, in this in this global economy, right? Um, primarily as a result of coronavirus and the global pandemic, right? Um, where central banks have really pinned rates down to to about zero or so. Um, interestingly enough, in terms of some of the wealthier clients that we have, we, we see them using debt to actually build wealth. So, um, it's not uncommon for a high net worth individual to have maybe a diversified portfolio in accordance to an investment policy statement that they built out to, to maximize the probability of them achieving their goals. And a lot of times the thought process is to never touch that money. It's long-term capital. Um, the, the intention is to let markets be on their side. Um, you know, over, since 1928, for example, over every rolling 25 year period, there's never been a downturn in the markets over a 25 year period. And so, you know, the wealthier um, use that to their advantage. And what they'll do is they'll do things like securities-based lending, where they're borrowing against their taxable portfolio, or I've seen folks borrow and, and leverage assets like, uh, you know, real estate or art or aircrafts or yachts, uh, or even lending against hedge fund positions at very low rates. You know, so if, if I can borrow, um, you know, the bank's money at two, two and a half percent or so, and use that to buy more assets that will gener generate me a yield in excess of two and a half percent while I still maintain my liquid portfolio. Now I have the velocity of money working in my favor and that new investment that I'm investing in only has to beat that hurdle rate of two and a half percent. So, you know, we, we see, especially in this low interest rate environment, folks being very intentional on how they think about utilizing leverage um, in order to, you know, increase their, their, their yield on their balance sheet. And as they get closer and closer to retirement, they start to unwind some of that. Okay, so what are the strategies when it comes to paying for an education, student loans? Should I go into debt, um, saving, for my, saving for my child's education without impacting a potential financial aid package? And then can I tack on to that, Christina? Um, getting out of college, what should I do? Should I pay back right away? Should I wait? Yep, definitely. So when you're going to college and heading off, you definitely want to apply for financial aid program, financial aid to see if you actually qualify. And there are student loans also if you can't afford certain fees for the schools. And when you're coming out in terms of paying back, there's income pays, payment repayment plans, pay as you earn repayment plans, certain um, income contingent repayment plans, 
And there's strategies also that you can employ to your education as well. So for in terms of investments, there are 529 plans. And these 529 plans allow you to actually, even for elementary school or secondary school as well, so K through 12, public, private, or religious schools, you can actually start putting up to about $15,000 per year. This is, the, this is the annual contribution limit in accordance with the annual gift exclusion amount. And it varies, it varies state to state, but you can start in putting that money away in an investment vehicle, which there are underlying investments in that investment vehicle that you can actually earn a growth appreciation. And the best thing about it is that it grows tax deferred. And so when you take out the withdrawals, if they're qualified withdrawals from the 529 plan, meaning that they're used for tuition, fees, books, and certain supplies, then the, those withdrawals will be, will be tax-free. And so I definitely, some people actually set up 529 plans for themselves. There's also in terms of other types of investments, there's series EE bonds, and then these bonds qualify for tax-free treatment if they are redeemed for education expenses. There are certain tax credits that are available, the lifetime learning credit, the American Opportunity Tax Credit, and these are credits that are available for parents as well as, as, well as their children. It's for the lifetime learning credit, that is the American Opportunity Tax Credit is only for your first four years of school. And then traditionally there's scholarships, there's grants, there's work study jobs, and there's other parents who have a lot of money that you can, or grandparents who hopefully can pay for our education. And then you also tacked on the question, if you, when you are coming out of school, should you pay down as soon as you come out immediately or should you wait? Um, you definitely want to look at what are the interest rates associated with the student loan debt that, that you took out, right? So if it's some debt, some student loans that you got through, through the school, if they're subsidized, the interest rates are going to be lower, essentially. If they're with a, a, a bank or so, they're going to be a higher interest rate. And I would definitely look at the, the interest rates and see, okay, can I potentially pay the minimum balance for this student loan if I'm due to start paying, paying back right away and then invest some of that additional money so I can gain some appreciation and then start paying down some lump sums. So that's a potential strategy that people can employ. So you mean if, if, the, if it's a low rate, keep the loan, if it's a high rate, try to pay it off? Is that the basic rule of thumb? Yeah, so it, 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 you think about it this way. Generally, the student loans are considered good debt also, right? And when you want to look at your whole credit picture as well and your FICO score, the student loans generally are some of the lowest debt you're going to have, right? So when you go to purchase some other finance, some other, some other investments, you're going to get generally charged a higher rate of interest. And so to build up your credit history as well, especially when people are just coming out, I don't recommend a, a host of credit card debt because those are high, much higher interest rates. Mm -hmm. So they're upwards north of 20% or so. Mm -hmm. And so if you have your student loans and you're, you're showing a good payment history, that actually paying on time makes up 35% of your FICO score, your credit score. So essentially you want to demonstrate that for as long as possible, you know, so you can start building up your credit and different things of, of that nature. But potentially if it's low, there's no rush to necessarily pay off that pay off that debt. Now you don't necessarily have to pay the minimum balance either. Mm -hmm. Some people start doubling the payments, tripling the payments as they start making more money, generally getting bonuses as well as getting increases in their salaries. So that brings us to our next topic. Um, company stock, what should you do with it when you leave a company and when you receive part of it as a bonus? Do you keep it for the long haul? Uh, do you sell it? And then let's move into bonus also, Anthony, since it's part of this question. Um, what should you do with your bonus? You know, some people think of their bonus as, as free money. Hey, let's party, let's play with it. But what should we really do with that bonus? Should we use it to pay off some big expense, some big debt? Should we use it to pay off, you know, a, a part of a mortgage or something? Sure. Uh, so I'll start with the, the company stock piece. Uh, you know, I, I, I think it's interesting, um, you know, we have a, a good amount of corporate executives as private clients. And uh, one of the things that we've 
really spend a lot of time just kind of tracking is our research team and our price objective of that respective stock, right? So, you know, Merrill Lynch covers over 3,000 different investments. And so by and large for folks who work at publicly traded companies, we have a handle on where our analysts think that the stock should be trading. So it, it's always good to have some type of, of um, understanding as to like what Wall Street and what analysts are thinking about the stock price because it may help you to think about, you know, do, how much of this that you actually want to have as a function of your total balance sheet. Um, so that, that's number one, just kind of have a, a, some, some type of a thought process on that front. Number two, what we do is we go through this exercise called the wealth allocation framework. Um, and it's a really fancy way of talking about creating different buckets of capital, right? And so maybe you have your personal bucket whereby, you know, you want to have high liquidity, maintain a very low risk and reward profile. Think about like cash, right? In that bucket, for example, or even personal real estate, for example. And then we have your markets bucket, which might be your diversified portfolio where you have stocks, bonds, and alternative investments, and so on and so forth. And the third bucket is really more so idiosyncratic risk, right? And so idiosyncratic risk means you have maybe a concentration in a, in a business or individual stock, or maybe there's a concentration in, in commercial real estate or whatever it may be. And, we, and the reason we break it up that way is because we want to think about all these assets as a function of your total balance sheet. So if you're comfortable right, with, you know, let's say you work at Tesla, for example, and Tesla stock is on fire and you're comfortable owning it, that's totally fine. And you're okay with that, having that idiosyncratic risk. Sure. You know, but maybe we want to lighten the load on the amount that we have as a function of your total balance sheet. So, you know, we're, we're always thinking about it from a big picture standpoint. And again, that, that takes a lot of the guesswork out. Um, so, uh, that, that's how I would think about that. And then you should have a strategy, right? So if the strategy is, Hey, look, you know, I, I work for a financial company, we're highly levered to uh, GDP and the economy and interest rates are pinned down. And so we're not as constructive on financials and we definitely want to sell our stock, you know, for, for this time around, shouldn't know when it's going to hit and have a strategy for, you know, selling it immediately or holding on to it because more often than not, people who do get paid company stock as a function of their bonus, they typically get it on a vesting schedule. So even though some of it hits, you still may have, you know, two thirds or 75% or of your bonus that is still, um, you know, not vested yet. So you have the intrinsic value there. And so maybe you are a little bit more comfortable with liquidating it. So that's a hyper specific question, but hopefully that thought process around how to think about it, it will help to inform some people. And, um, you know, the, the bonus piece is it's not free money, right? That's a part of your total comp that it, it that's not free money. That's, that's money that you worked really hard for. I don't, I don't see very many people who think of it, um, as free money, even if your company gives you maybe a special one-time bonus or whatever it may be, that is money that you earned. Right. Um, you know, when we think about the psychology of money, sometimes you get this like house money effect whereby money falls from the sky and you feel like you can think about it a little bit differently, but it's money is money. Right. And so if you, um, if you're anticipating it and, um, you know, it shouldn't be a surprise to you because you should understand how you're getting compensated, uh, pro tip, reach out to your HR department and understand your compensation. Um, then, you know, you should be thinking about the same way you would, you, sh you should be thinking about it the same way you would think about it. Whenever when we talked about if you have a thousand extra dollars or a lump sum, you know, am I paying down debt? Am I saving in a diversified portfolio? Am I saving for education? And so everything should be listed out. There should be no guessing. There should be no winging it as it relates to your personal finance. Uh, and no winging it is because we've moved from pension plans and defined benefit plans to this new age where the savings and the onus of retirement is, is, is on us. And so we need to take control and ownership of our finances and be very intentional because if we're not, we're going to look up and say, I wish I was doing something a little bit differently 10 or 20 years ago. And we all know how quickly time goes. And if you're 85 years old or 90 years old, you say that was the fastest 85 or 90 years uh, that, you know, that, that was a, a fast 85 or a fast 95 and time's really flying. So um, that's, that's how I would think about bonuses.
Okay, we are going to move into the questions on uh, that people have been sending in and I want to thank um, our colleague Andrew Hamilton because he's been trying to curate them. They're, they're actually coming in pretty fast, but one of the big things people have been asking about is debt. Um, someone said, hey, we should all live debt free. Well, that's great if you can, <laughs> um, but we're not all like Oprah or whatever. So, um, and it's not always the wisest thing to live debt free. But let's get a little bit more into good debt, bad debt. And then after that, we'll talk about mortgages. So I think people are still unsure. Someone's saying, do I pay off my credit cards using my 401, K paying off credit cards using 401k to pay off debt? No I mean, way. Yeah, that's your, that's your retirement. That's your savings. I mean, so let's, let's talk yeah. about some of these strategies. But remember, we're at 7.30. We're going to 8. We've got a lot of questions to answer. Yeah, so I'll be, I'll be really quick here. So definitely, we, we, we kind of touched on this about good debt versus, versus debt, bad debt. And it's, it's okay to have some debt. And I so know that people have read Dave Ramsey's books, and they've read some other other books and they talk about cash lifestyle or the fire movement and all of these different things. But sometimes you do have to have debt. So I own a home, for instance, and that's something that I am, that it's being amortized and I'm paying it down and we'll pay it off soon. But that's something that I chose to get into as an investment property, right? And in terms of that, I look at it as good debt because it's part of my overall strategy. So when you look at your total financial plan and your strategy, you'll decide, okay, is this something that's good debt or, or bad debt? Anthony already gave us some strategies that really wealthy people use to leverage debt that they have on their balance sheet so that they can actually get into some other income producing assets, right? So that's something that we want to definitely take ad advantage of. And so there are times when you have debt and it actually is working for you. Um, so that's the kind of debt that you want to be, be in. The question in regards to the 401k, this is near and dear to my heart because I have family members who consistently believe that the 403b, the 401k, the retirement plan is a vehicle to fund lifestyle and or, you know, to pay down other, other things, other debts, et cetera. So someone mentioned about credit card debts. Now you look at the credit card debt maybe your rate, it could be 18 something percent, it could be 20% or more. But when you look at the penalties that you will get hit with from early withdrawal for the 401k, and then when you look at the taxation that you're going to get hit with, that's going to be in excess of the interest rates that are that you're paying on that credit card, because you're going to be taking out that money prior to your retirement age essentially so we wouldn't necessarily encourage you to do that now during these ex extreme times of COVID, we do recognize that there are some extreme cases where people may need to do those things and there have been some arrangements made where the penalties are essentially uh voided during this period anthony you want to add anything there? yeah I'll, I'll just add i'll just add one thing right um if, if we understand the game and understand how we can use some of these products to our advantage, it can really be a game changer, right? So about four years ago, um, I, I never really used credit cards. I used my, my debit card for everything. Literally everything, I swipe my debit card, debit card. And now today I use my credit card for everything. And so what I do is uh, I have a, like a high points, you know, credit cards. So I get a ton of points. And anything that I would normally use my debit card for, I use my credit card for. And I never buy anything um, that's like way over my head. So I know I'm going to pay it off to zero every single month. And so groceries, food, transit, every single thing, every dollar that I spend, cell phone bill, uh, everything goes on, on my card. So it's actually easy to track, right? Everything comes out of one spot. The only thing I don't pay with credit cards is my mortgage payment. And um, every month I pay that balance down to zero every single month. So my credit has gone through the roof. I get a ton of points. And so I can, you know, if you want to use, think about free money and, you know, um, and kind of blow money on something like that, you know, that, that's kind of what I use my, my points for. So, you know, I get two kids, I get family. So, you know, it's pretty expensive to fly anywhere. So I use my points um, to cash those in and turn those into real dollars. And so it's just a, fun a different function of the way I use my credit card. 
But when you pay it to zero, you pay 0% in interest rate, um, right? You, you pay zero interest and you just pay it down to zero every single month. And so that's just a, a, another little tip that, that I think makes a lot of sense. And it's a great way to improve your credit score, build up that credit history, and also get points from, from the bank um, that you normally wouldn't get. Okay, I want to, uh, before we get to the next question, I had promised to give you guys a little bit of uh, some figures on things. And while uh, Andrew is curating some of the questions, I want to just say that, you know, the home is the largest asset for many American families, but black to white ownership gap is the widest in 50 years. And that's according to the Urban Institute. Also, 60% of white families have at least one retirement account, while just 34% of Black families do. And that's according to the most recent Federal Reserve survey. Um, when it comes to passing on wealth, 23% of white families surveyed by two Fed economists report receiving an inheritance, while just 9% of Black families did. So the gap is really uh, enormous for some of these categories. And that's something to think about. And, but it's also something that we could start closing with smarter strategies. And that's what financial planners are, are there for also. Sure. So, um, I just wanted to do to mention that while, while we are getting the next question. And I think a lot of people are asking about their mortgages. Should they pay them off, especially if they're going into retirement? Um, what's the deal with mortgages? Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. So I think that we should challenge the way we think about mortgages. Um, I think that the traditional um, approach is to just get a 30 year fixed mortgage and um, not think about it. And if rates get lower or if it makes some sense to, you know, if, if there's an opportunity to, to lower your rate or save a couple bucks, you refinance and you have another 30 year loan. So the first thing I typically ask people when they think about their mortgage is, how long do you plan on staying in the house? And a lot of times I find that there's a liability mismatch there. I'll, I'll talk to people who will say, I'm, I'm, I have a 15 year mortgage, I'm, I'm really trying to accelerate this thing and pay it off. Um, you know, I have a really low rate and I wanna you know, pay off this mortgage. And I go, okay, great, how long do you plan on staying in the house? They're like, oh no more than eight years. I go, then why do you have a 15 year mortgage? Why, why are you hyper accelerating the, the payment down of your principal on a property that, you know, you don't plan to stand for a very long time. So maybe we should, you know, if you're going to be in the house for eight years, maybe you get a 10 year arm and have a lower monthly payment or be able to save yourself some cash flow. Cause when you think about an amortization schedule on a 30 year mortgage, the first eight years of a 30 year mortgage are almost interest only, right? They, they preload the interest so that the bank, you know, get paid first uh, and reduce their risk of pre and, you know, in year 27, 28, 29, that's when you're making big chunks towards that principal. So I would just think about liability matching and, and being more thoughtful about how long you actually plan on staying in the house because Everybody, the, the not so secret secret is that if you ever need to tap your home, right, you got to go through a really arduous process. You know, it can take anywhere from 30 to 60 days to do a refinance or a cash out or a home equity line of credit. And you got to do a title search and you got to pay attorneys mm -hmm. and, you know, you have to go through an entire audit of your finances. You got to give them a W-2 and a pay stub and, if you're doing it because you need the money and you're up on hard times, that's probably any money, right? So the value of your home is not going to be determined by the amount of cost. The value of your home is going to be determined by the, 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 the value that somebody thinks it's worth on the day that you put it on the market. So, you know, I just try to think a little bit differently about that stuff and maybe a little bit unorthodox, but you know, when, when challenging ourselves to think about some of the stuff a little bit differently, sometimes we find that, we're, we're just doing things because our parents did it or our grandparents did it. And it's not necessarily matched what was most important to us. Now, Christina talked about owning commercial real estate as an investment. And so if you own that outright, then that means that you're making more money on the cash flow from your renters. So maybe you think about your personal home differently than an investment property. So it's really all about that exercise. But as you get closer and closer to retirement and you want to de-risk your balance sheet and have a lower overhead, 
so that you can take less risk in markets and take, you know, and put less stress on your personal balance sheet in order to maximize your retirement income prospects. By and large, generally, you certainly want to be thinking about de-risking the amount of uh, loans and, and mortgages and things of that nature that you have on your balance sheet. Yeah. Oh, Julie, Julie you're, you're, you're muted. Mute, you're mute. You're, I think you're still on mute, Julie. Can I Sorry about that. Muted. Sorry about huh. that, everyone. Huh. Um, there you go. Roth uh, 401k, which one, how much goes in? Definitely. I'll, I'll take that. So you, if you, if your job offers a Roth 401k, you definitely would want to take advantage of that. So you can contribute max um, for up to about, there's, there's max, there's, there's, there are limits for every single year. So your job will about what $28,000 or so for the year. It changes every year. So I could be getting a 2020 number mistaken. And then your job will have a match for you, what you can actually put in. In terms of the Roth like IRA, because I saw some questions as well, like that's something different. That's where you would be able to put up to those per year. Remember with the Roth, all of this is after tax money, the tax money, which is a difference between a regular 401k which would be your pre-tax money. The Roth is after tax. Um, so you always want to keep that, keep that in mind. But it, I would definitely go for the Roth. Okay, so the Roth over the traditional 401k. Either, either one, the, the company will, will match for them. And you can definitely, for the pre-tax, the, the traditional 401k, you get the match from the company, you put in, Anthony talked about the salary deferral. So generally when you have, we no longer have pensions. So when you have the 401k, you have the option of getting that salary to keep for yourself or to have the salary deferred, right? Most people, I would do the salary deferred because it's pre-tax, pre but it all depends on where do you think you're going to fall in terms of your potential tax rate, right? Because if you believe that you're going to be in a higher tax bracket later on at some point, then it may be best for you to say, okay, I want to take the money right now and put it into a Roth 401k or a Roth vehicle because I'm going to use my tax rate for today, especially during this period where we have lower tax rates. There's speculation that it could go up after a while. It may be beneficial to do that. Okay. Now we have some stock questions coming in. Um, Somebody wanted to know about ownership and partial partial ownership of stock. Someone is wondering about how much risk, how much should they get into the market. Someone's wondering about uh, trading on their own. Yeah, so we, we talked a bit about some of the fractional shares. So even Acorns is the platform. Um, Stash is another, is another platform. A lot of the brokerage houses now, they also do fractional shares as well. So Schwab, for instance, Fidelity, um, you can talk about some of the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch programs as, as well, essentially. But those are some platforms where you can get started with the fractional shares immediately. You don't have to have a lot of money at all. Yeah. And, and, and just to add to that, you know, that's, you know, um, one of the things that we typically see for people who just getting started is to use mutual funds, right? So you can have a very low cost of entry to get a diversified portfolio um, whereby inside of a mutual fund format, you can get stocks, bonds, a, a, a global asset allocation. So if you're not particularly keen on what you should be invested in and just want to kind of get your feet wet, you can use something like a mutual fund or an exchange traded fund, which typically have very low minimums so that you can get invested and start to get your feet wet. When you think about how much you should do to start and how much it should be as a function of, of your total liquidity, you know, back to that balance sheet conversation, right? And find out how much money you can allocate to long-term capital and, um, you know, be able to think about, you know, money that you don't have to think about using over many, many market cycles. And re remember time is on your side. And um, if you are able to be a holder and use time as you know your guide, you can let the compounding of wealth between capital appreciation as well as interest and dividends 
and that compounding of growth over many, many years be your friend instead of like trying to figure out if today is the day or tomorrow's tomorrow and what you should buy and at what stock price you got it or anything like that. Okay. Um, and someone is, a few people are asking about life insurance. Um, is it a good way to, to pass down wealth to your children that is tax free? Is it something that people, yeah. who, what, who should think about it and in what scenario? I mean, sure. I, I would think that someone, anyone with children should, should really have life insurance. Yeah. So. so, and I'll jump in here. Uh, we're all guaranteed to die, right? And so, if you think about leverage, if you think about life insurance as an asset and not necessarily a liability, it's certainly a way to break the mold. When we start thinking about true wealth and inheritance and generational wealth, to be able to have insurance as a part of your strategy, to liability match, right? So if I have two kids, like I do, and I haven't fully saved for both of them to go to college yet, because I haven't, because my kids are six and four, but God forbid I pass away today, I have enough insurance to match all the liabilities and the things that are most important to me right now, which is paying off my mortgage, paying for uh, private school for both of my children, and then also having enough income or having enough assets that's generated in order to generate yield from a portfolio to replace the income that I would make over that, over that cycle. So. That's absolutely the key. Um, and I'm going to just take it a step further and saying, you know, trust in estate planning is extremely important. I know it, you, you didn't ask about that, but it kind of all goes hand in hand, right? Yeah. We talk about being intentional, right? And you don't want the state, you don't want the state of domicile where you live to make a determination on who gets your assets, on who makes financial decisions for you if you're incapacitated or of who's making medical decisions for you or who gets custody of your children. God forbid something happens and, and you pass away, right? So simple documents like a will, healthcare proxy, power of attorney, and guardianship are basic staples. And I'll repeat those, will, last will and testament, healthcare proxy, power of attorney, and guardianship are very, very important. So that, you know, if, if you have, um, a, a sister or an aunt or an uncle and you want those people to take care of your kids god forbid something happens to you because they share the same core values as you wouldn't you want to be the person that makes that decision instead of in my case the state of new york so i think that intentionality and not letting this stuff decay and constantly revisiting it right um is is really important so i i, I tell some stories but i know we're getting cut cut up on time here but I really did want to make sure that everybody heard the, the importance of trust and estate planning. Yeah. And even if you don't have children, guys, I would definitely encourage everyone to at least at a minimum look into term life insurance because this can, and also replacement income insurance as well, because when you're working, sometimes I saw a question coming up. Sometimes your job may not provide you with enough of the disability income. God forbid something is worse to happen to you. So sometimes that, that threshold's up to like 60% of your salary, which may not be sufficient to cover your expenses and your costs. So sometimes people supplement that with some other type of coverage in terms of replacement replacement and income insurance, also known as disability insurance. Look into long-term as well, not just the short-term disability, because if you're out for a longer stint, then you won't you won't continue to to get those those payments okay so it is 748 and we do need to to get going here um investing in startups and penny stocks and what would um someone that is someone's question that that andrew just sent me and what would you um consider a diverse portfolio so let's let's throw in efs mutual funds annuities um you know, index funds is something else someone asked about. So, I mean, maybe you could just sort of give us a, a quick broad overview of a diverse portfolio, but I think it also just depends on the person and how much risk they're, they're willing to take. And that's something that they should be working out with their financial advisor. Yeah. Yeah, at Merrill Lynch, by and large, we're, we're prohibited from the sell, whether it's, um, you know, solicited or unsolicited of penny stocks, for example, not a lot of visibility there, right?
right? And what we find is that successful individuals who work so hard to save their money don't necessarily want to gamble it. Um, and not to say you couldn't make money in penny stocks, but I feel a lot more comfortable with understanding and knowing what I own, having visibility and transparency and investing in companies with large balance sheets with free cash flow um, that are industry leaders in their respective space. So what we try to challenge our clients um, to do is focus on their savings habits instead of trying to focus on reaching for risk and yield in their portfolios. So if you focus on your balance sheet, cash flows and savings, we can take a lot of pressure off of trying to like swing for the fences uh, which can invariably lead to big mistakes um, in, in the marketplace. So that, that's, that's my thought process on, on penny stocks. Um, investing in private businesses is a totally different animal, right? Um, you could do that as in, in a partnership, right? If you have access, right, we, for, for qualified purchasers, for individuals who have over $5 million of liquidity in, in investment assets, we can get them access to things like private equity and private businesses and private credit and private debt. Um, but those, those are really sophisticated strategies. And in many instances, it takes anywhere between, you know, seven and 12 years for you to get your money back. Your money back. Right. And so <laughs> that's really long term patient capital. And, um, you know, you certainly want to be talking to a financial professional and somebody who understands that. Uh, and, and I would also recommend talking to somebody who's a fiduciary in nature and not somebody who's just kind of pitching you a product. Um, and then as, a, as it relates to all the other products, like mutual funds, ETFs, index funds, those are all just entry points and ways in which to get access to global capital markets and kind of based on you know, the, the dialogues and the conversations that you have with the financial professional you should be able to figure out what's most prudent and what's not. And a lot of that has to do with fees, liquidity, performing the strategy. Um, and instead of, Continuing to talk, we're seeing to talk a little bit about uh, diversification and asset allocation and risk yeah, management. Definitely. So I was just going to say what if the last point that Anthony made in terms of you want to make sure that something in terms that's very very risky and in terms of asset allocation, you depending on your age will specify exactly how much you should be invested in equities, how much you you should be invested in bonds because obviously the longer time horizon that you have, you can be in a riskier investment such as such as equities. You don't need a lot of fixed income coming in. And, and plus that fixed income that's coming in from in the form of bonds, it would get taxed. And so generally you're looking for growth the younger you are. So you want to be in stocks that it's essentially are going to appreciate. But you would sit down with your planner and go through what your strategy would be look at those, whether it be mutual funds, ETFs, which is a basket of securities, index funds, which are essentially tracking the movements of, of the markets, right? So now Tesla may be added to the, to the S&P. So that will give, a, give, it a, give it a jump and you have ex essentially have exposure into that stock indirectly, right? If you're purchasing an index fund that's tracking the, the S&P. And so we can go into those specifics, definitely contact myself or Anthony, um, and we could definitely help you with that. Or so it could be someone else that you're working with already. And so what is the, the, if somebody is trying to do a lot of this on their own, are there any tools if they don't um, or can't go to a financial planner because they don't have the, the funds available? What, are there any tools that they could use on their own? Any cheat sheets or anything? Yeah, definitely. I mean, their brokerage accounts has a lot of good tools like Schwab has tools, uh, Fidelity. Schwab recently purchased, um, they purchased TD Ameritrade essentially. So that's more and more tools and platforms that they have available to, to clients. Uh, Fidelity has tools, personal capital. There's a whole bunch of, a host of tools out there where people can track investment performance, Yahoo, Yahoo Finance, um, as well as a lot of blogs out there and different reporting where you can get market data, stay in touch and get a pulse on what's going on and actually build out your own charts. You can build watch lists as well where you get alerts that will let you know in terms of stock movements and prices once you put in your targets, et cetera. So you, can, you definitely can do some of these things on, on your own for sure. And, uh, and, and to add to that, so Christina's touching more so 
on the saving investment piece. And then, you know, I know that we have uh, some tools. We have a website, um, I believe it's called Better Money Habits. If you Google Better Money Habits, and I believe uh, we'll be sending out a link on that, but it goes through all the different stages of your life. So it's talking about saving and budgeting, so about credit, right? So this is a place to get education through, uh, you know, a, a Bank of America resource that is free and it's available. Um, mm -hmm. talking about home loans and finance and things like insurance and things of that nature. So for like that holistic planning approach to, to kind of marry up with the, the, the saving and investing, um, there's definitely a lot of tools out there. Um, and then, you know, there's financial professionals like us where, you know, the, the reason why we're on this call is so that we can be helpful and give back. Um, and so we're, we're not on this call as a sales pitch to try to get new clients. So if somebody wants to, to you know, have a conversation to us, you know, that's, that's why we're here. We're here to be a resource for you all. You guys are part of our community. Uh, we, we, we grew up like you. We look like you. And we want to help folks like yourself. Um, we're extremely busy. But if you're serious about it, we can have a phone call at 630 in the morning and talk about it while I'm on my, month, while I'm on my daily run. I, you know, I don't really care. It's, it's something that's important to me. So, um, you know, feel free to utilize us. I feel like a lot of times the resources are there, but, you know, you just don't feel comfortable reaching out and asking for help because it's a little outside of your comfort zone. And, you know, the reason why National Black MBA Association is doing stuff like this is so that you can see our faces and know that we're genuinely here to be helpful and not trying to like sell you yep. a product, you know? So that's something We've else that's important to us. We've got four minutes left and, and we need to close it out before that, but how does someone find a trustworthy financial planner and how much should they cost? Like, can you give us a ballpark? We weren't really gonna talk about that because it varies depending on each person's needs and yep. market they're in. And But can you give people like a broad sense of where they can find someone trustworthy and what you know what they should think about paying you want to take that christina yeah definitely so there are sites uh the way you can go and look up anthony mentioned the term fiduciary someone who's going to actually put your interests above their own and they're held to a much higher standard and so you can go to like even cfp board and, and look at different certifications that people have and to make sure that they're that they're registered in terms of the fees it's going to vary widely because some people are fee based some people are you know commission some people have a a, a mix between between the two etc and so i don't want to throw out numbers out here because it's going to vary the people are on this call from my understanding from different states as well so pricing structures will 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 vary but um, like Anthony said, we could definitely speak to you. You know, like we're looking to help everybody out. So uh, just if you have a call, anything specific, and yep. we could definitely let you know if something looks off. <laughs> yeah, and, and we, we're also going to be circulating, I believe, uh, a list of about 30 questions that if you're talking to someone or interviewing an advisor, that we think are really good questions to, to make sure that they have your best interests at heart and also to make sure that they have done you know the work that they need to do to to earn the right to, to custody and steward your assets as well 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 i want to say thank you to everybody who's tuned in and who's listened to us and who's joined us and i know that um there are going to be some closing words i believe i don't know if i get the last word or not i'm not 100 percent sure um so I, I know that this has been an amazing opportunity. I've learned a lot. I hope everyone else has learned a lot. Um, they, we offer a lot of these with different subjects all the time. Um, they're an hour long. Um, we're gonna end this one at eight, but we thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you all so much. The information that you guys shared the time that you took to pour into our members such valuable information i cannot thank you enough on behalf of the association um so those of you who are listening many of you are your feedback is also important to us and so you will see a link to in the chat box on how you can give us your feedback the first 25 people to complete the survey will be entered into a chance to win an Amazon gift card. So you do not want to miss that. Don't delay. Click on that link and give us your feedback. 
as I mentioned at the top of the hour, our registration is open for our virtual conference and career fair where you can receive informative programming such as this, in addition to an opportunity to get the job that you are desperately looking for. So you will see a link to that in the chat as well. Again, panelists, Andrew, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all for giving us your evening, an hour of your evening, and have a wonderful rest of your night. Thank you. Good night. Thank everyone. you. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.